SJC 11757, Bernard Sabago et al. and Edward J. Tunjin et al. Good morning, Your Honors. Um, I'm Shannon Liss Reardon, and with me is Adelaide Pagano. We're pleased to represent the plaintiffs in this case. Uh, Your Honors, this case is brought on behalf of shift drivers in the city of Boston. Now, the majority of cab drivers in the city of Boston, this is how they drive a cab. They have to pay a shift fee um, in order to work. So they start every day. They don't own their own cab. They don't own their own medallion. In order to do their job every day, they have to start out in the hole by paying a shift fee of approximately $100 for a 12-hour shift. Some they, rent, they rent the vehicle. Well, the defendants portray it as that they're renting the vehicle. They're not renting the vehicle? Well, they're paying a fee to work. They're also they're called lease fees. They're also called shift fees. Um, and so, when matter what they're called, I mean, essentially, they get the vehicle, they drive it around the city, pick up whoever they want, drop them off, collect whatever tips they collect. Yes, they, they've got their own little business. Well, that's the way the defendants want to portray it. But well, let's, isn't that the way it is? Well, let's let's think about this in a different industry. That's the way it is and has been in Boston since the 19, so approximately 1980. Imagine a restaurant um, changing the way that it operates so that you have a separate corporation that runs the kitchen and prepares the food. You have a separate corporation that owns the building and advertises to bring customers into the restaurant. And then you hire independent contractor wait staff who have to pay $100. How does $100. Cambridge do it? How does Cambridge do it, or any other city? <clears throat> well, in throughout Massachusetts, some of many companies use the same model that's used in Boston, but many companies still use the model that was used prior to the changeover in the 1970s, where the cab drivers are employees, um, and they're either paid an hourly wage, plus they get to keep their tips, or they have a commission system where they split the fares on either a 50-50 or 60-40 basis with the companies and keep their tips. That's the way it worked universally in Boston prior to this change in the 1970s when the city of Boston began allowing companies to classify drivers as independent contractors and shift to the system where they paid to was, work. Was that uh, intentional? I, I see in your brief that there's a suggestion that the medallion owners did this to avoid uh, having to classify people as employees. Is what's what's the evidence of that? Well, we're seeing in many industries. I mean, we have a little bit of background information in the record about what led to the system, but essentially, it's it's spectacularly profitable for these owners, these cab companies, as well as employers in general, to treat their workers as independent contractors instead of employees, because that way they get to charge them to work, just no, as no, we've I, seen. I understand your argument. I'm just trying to make sure I've got it right, that the owners devise this system for the purpose that you say they devise. I understand that it works for them, but I want to follow up on, on this suggestion that it was intentional. My, my understanding is that the owners persuaded the city of Boston to allow them to shift to this type of a system, and the city of Boston allowed them to do that. Uh, now, let's assume you win. What happens? Well, the drivers would be classified as employees and have all of the rights under the wage laws. Some system would have to go into place by which it could either be, as I just suggested, they get an hourly wage plus tips, or they split the fares plus tips, but with some system in place to guarantee that they're, they're earning at least minimum wage and overtime. Um, and the system could essentially go back to the way that it was before the 1980s. So we would essentially be <coughs> transforming Rule, uh, <coughs> is it rule four, is it? A rule 403. I mean, well, we, I mean, because we would be, right now there is no draft contract in place. 
we have mostly a cash business and we'd have to deal with the issue of how the owners would be sure that they're receiving the cash the cabbies are getting. I mean, there's a certain simplicity to this system, which is that the owners don't need to worry about whether they're getting the cash paid by the uh, persons who are being driven. They just get their fee up front and then they say, whatever you earn on your own is yours. Well, a couple points. First of all, as the city of Boston has agreed, nothing in Rule 403 requires the system of the drivers being independent contractors rather than employees. There's in the model lease agreement that the city has drafted an optional independent contractor provision. Um, there's no, there's their maximum lease rates, but there's no minimum lease rate, and the city also, has testified. But, but, but there's also no optional employee agreement. Well, I mean, there's, there's nothing that speaks to how this should work. Well, but there's nothing that says that they can't no, that's pay not them the wage question, plus though. tips. It, it's not, I don't think it's a question of whether the rule 403 prohibits it. It's just, how's it going to work? I mean, because all that's in 403 now are um, models that are built on the system that's in place. <clears throat> are you saying that? You don't need to have those, and the owners will have to come up with their own way without the regulation? Well, as I said, there are companies that today in Massachusetts treat their drivers as employees. There may even be some in Boston, although no one in this case has been able to identify any, but, but, but there may be some. And the city has said there's nothing that would be wrong with doing it that way. Um, to your question about the cash, remember that many more transactions are being done by credit cards these days. And actually, the way the credit cards work is the drivers don't actually get the money right then. It gets processed through a credit card, and the driver gets their split, and the, um, the companies get their split, similar to what you're seeing in restaurants. Um, th in the credit card companies? The credit, in other words, the credit card companies dole out to the drivers their share, and they right. dole out to the companies their share. Just like in restaurants, the, the waiters aren't taking, when, transactions are done by credit card, the waiters aren't taking it all in cash, they, you know, they, wait, they do the credit cards and they get their share after the I'm fact. Miss, I'm missing this. So what, what share does the company get of the fares? Um, well, they get a P, that, well, their credit card fees. There's a 6% credit card right. fee. Some portion of that goes to the company. The drivers get their cut after the 6%. There are also fees that are taken out, for instance, for vouchers. So in other words, when, the, when it's processed through a credit card, it's not going directly to the driver. They have to wait some period of time. My point is, is that if, there, if we went back to the pre-1980 system, which worked for decades, where the drivers took a share of the fees, um, the company took a share of the fees, and the drivers got to keep all their tips, it worked. It worked for many decades. Um, so the mere fact that it's easier to do it this way, the mere fact that the city of Boston under Rule 403 <clears throat> has allowed it to work this way does not mean that it's legal under the current version of state law, which came into effect when the legislature amended 148B in 2004 to make it one of the strongest independent contractor laws in the country. And as we've pointed out, Courts around the country, even under far less stringent independent contractor tests, have found cab drivers in a variety of situations to be employees for purposes of unemployment, workers' comp, et cetera. And if our Section 148B, um, Chapter 149, Section 148B, which has been hailed across the country as one of the strongest tests in the country, uh, if, if drivers aren't employees under this test, but they can be employees under all of these more difficult, multi-factor control-based tests, it just frankly really doesn't make sense. And there have been attempts, as we pointed out in our briefs, to water down 148B, to exempt certain industries from it, and the legislature has uh, just has rejected those. There's no exception that was written into the law for cab drivers, the fact that the city of Boston has condoned this system but has not required it is not, cannot be a defense to a violation of a state law because then otherwise any industry could lobby itself out of a state law by getting municipalities to pass various rules that would exempt them. The issue is not really whether or not the city of Boston can override a state law. The question is whether the fact that it's a regulated industry uh, 
means that the categorization that the city has employed for these persons is one that should be respected by us. But again, the city of Boston has not and has explicitly disclaimed that it has categorized drivers as independent contractors. It has taken I understand that, a hands-off approach. But it does characterize them as, you know, as hackney drivers. It does have distinct definitions and categories. It licenses them separately from the owners. It does set forth particular categories, which, and, and I guess one of the arguments is that we should respect this, the categorization that a regulated industry, that the regulator for the regulated industry has employed. Well, the city of Boston has been empowered to set regulations. If you go back to the 1930 statute enabling the city to do that, they're able to regulate, and they do in fact regulate, many of the details of the taxi industry. For instance, um, what, what the qualifications are to get a taxi hackney license, where cab stands should be placed, what colors the cab, the different cab companies' cabs should be painted, all of the things of that matter. There's nothing in the statute from 1930 that says that the city has the power to override state wage regulations and determine how the drivers should be classified for purposes of the wage laws. And it wasn't until many decades later that the legislature came in with a broad remedial statute saying these are the rules as to who is going to be an employee and who's going to be an independent contractor. And there's nothing that <coughs> contradicts anything that the city did. The city's regulations can still stand even if they are classified pursuant to 148B as employees. They can still say what colors the cabs should be, what the requirements are to get a hackney license, just like, for instance, there are regulations for what <laughs> tests doctors need to pass, but that doesn't mean that they're not employed by hospitals or nurses or oh, just- there are, there are companies out there that rent trucks, moving trucks, right? Right. I rent them all the time. I have kids, they move all the time. But I could do that for profit. I could rent trucks and move people for money. <clears throat> right? And so does that make me an employee of the truck rental company? Well, the truck rental company is not holding itself out to the public as being in the moving business. The truck <clears throat> rental company is um, That's is the difference, it's trucks. holding itself out? To, well, it's not the nature of the... Of, of the transaction, it's the sort of the advertisement? Well, the lower courts, who in a variety of industries have decided as a legal matter what types of workers are employees and which are independent contractors under 148B, have looked to a couple of different things in making this analysis. One factor they've looked at is how the company holds itself out, both in its advertising um, and its statements to the Commonwealth as to what type of business it's in. It's one factor. Another factor that the courts have looked at is um, whether the company relies on the work being performed by these workers such that if these workers didn't exist, there would be no business. Well, if uh, people didn't rent trucks, there would be no truck rental business. I mean, yes, rental companies depend on people renting things. Right, so I'm, not, I'm quite, not quite clear about your... Um, Hypothetical. So you're saying that if you rent a truck my from U-Haul and then you sublease it to I'm someone else. I'm a mover. Yes. But I don't want to own any trucks, so I rent them from Hertz or any other number of places, and I use them. I rent them, and I move people around, and I make money at it. Well, well, so exactly. You're a mover. Hertz and U-Haul do not hold themselves out to be movers. They're not in the moving company. They're in, they're in the business of renting trucks. Boston Cab advertises itself on its website, in the phone book, um, as a cab company. We're the greenest cab company in Massachusetts. Um, the, they have a corporate accounts where you can set up and uh, you know, charge your, your cab rides with Boston Cab through their corporate account. Um, Edward Tatungian said in his deposition that he hopes that when customers see that brown and white cab coming toward them, they'll know that's a Boston cab, that's a good quality cab. Quality truck. It's a quality cab. We rent quality cabs. 
Right, so U-Haul rents quality cabs, but U-Haul doesn't say we're a moving company. It doesn't say we're going to move anyone. That makes the difference, how the company represents itself to the world, not the relationship between the renter and the company. Well, the question is what the usual course of business is. Now, if companies could define themselves as being however they want, this is what Judge Wolf talked about in the Janet King decision. If you could break it up, you, you would completely evade 148B and prong two, if a company could say, well, certain functions are a separate company and other functions are a certain function. We're seeing many companies say managerial and executive functions are different from the functions performed by the actual employees performing the service of the company. You can't do that. Go back to my restaurant example. Imagine if a restaurant says, okay, the kitchen is a whole separate company. They prepare the food, but a separate company brings the customers in the door. And the wait staff, they're just independent. We're going to charge them $100 per shift, and they can keep whatever they can get from the customers, from selling the food and but the But they have tips. to work in our restaurant. What's that? But they have to work in our restaurant, have to serve our customers. Right, but just like Boston cab drivers are serving Boston cab customers. You call up Boston cab, you want a cab, a Boston cab driver arrives at your door. You see a Boston cab going down the street, it's, um, uh, you say, oh, I'm going to get that Boston cab, you get that Boston cab. Just an important point, in the, in the, when I deposed Ed Tatunjan, he also owns a livery service, a black car um, limousine service. Um, which used to classify these limousine drivers as independent contractors, but he recently changed their classification to employees. And when I asked him, what's the difference between your limo drivers and your cab drivers? Why are you classifying the limo drivers who used to have to pay for their cars, pay for their limos? Uh, why are they employees but independent, con but your cab drivers who have to pay for their cabs are independent contractors? He, he couldn't tell me the difference. He just said, well, it's on advice of counsel. He couldn't tell me the difference. Do, do you, um, I, I take it you would say, if, if I understand that Rule 403 doesn't address this question, um, if it did explicitly, you would say can't do that because it, it's, it would in, a, in, in substance be preempted by the state law. Is that, would that be your position? Exactly, exactly. And, and the state law that we're looking at here, which was passed in 1930, you know, unlike the Monell case, which I know is before you, doesn't say anything in particular about independent contractors or employees. It just gives the city broad authority to regulate, like I said, the details of where should cab stands be, what do hackney drivers need to do in order to get a license to drive for one of these companies. And remember, these drivers, they can't go off on their own and just start their own company. They don't own a cab, they don't own a medallion, they are beholden to these companies and have to pay a shift fee in order to work. They're not, it's clear that they're employees. The question here really is, who is their employer? And because of this confusing system, a shell game has essentially been set up so that everyone's trying to distance themselves from being these drivers' employer, which this court has condemned in, in the De Fiori case, and I would suggest in the Depianti case, and uh, David Weil, who's now the head of the U.S. Department of Labor Wage and Hour Division has written about this fissured employment problem, which is exactly what this industry represents. All these different little companies, none of whom want to claim that to take the responsibility of being employers for these clearly employee working people who have to pay to do their jobs every day, just like the cleaning workers in the janitorial franchise cases. All right, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Good. I represent uh, the Tatunjin uh, defendants and uh, John Bida and ITOA. And, uh, I'm going to take nine minutes, and uh, my brother, Mr. DiNapoli, is going to argue for Mr. Summers and, and his company uh, for the remaining six. Uh, first of all, I want to start off by, by making a couple of very important points from our point of view. First of all, this is a regulated industry, which means something highly confident, uh, uh, consequential, and that is that these people are, are operating their businesses, uh, uh, which they have, can only enter the business at all if the city permits them to do so, and their pricing, that is, it's all capped. They, they can't make any more money than the city allows them to make. Their books are open. This court has held that their tax returns are open. Um, there is, I don't think, it's hard to imagine a more comprehensively 
regulated well, industry. Well, except that the city takes the position that it does not regulate your relationship with the drivers. Yeah, well, I, I frankly think that's a disingenuous. I don't think that's honest. Well, well how, do, how, where in 403 does it regulate, <clears throat> does it regulate your relationship with the drivers as opposed to its relationship it with the drivers? It prescribes, it, what it does is it prescribes uh, in detail it has a form lease. Which has optional independent contractor provision. Well, right? it only has, it, well, first of all, there's no way to in or, opt in or out. It's inconceivable, I mean, nothing in the document that shows how to opt in or opt out. No one who is a, a, a lessor would opt out and say, this is not an independent contract. The reality is that the only authorized means to do this business there are four means, and they're in the record, undisputed. One is owner-operated, the other three are all involved leasing. There is no other way to do it. My sister has said to you today, and has said in the record, that the city has classified these drivers as independent contractors since the 1970s. It is not disputed, really, that the classification has, number one, been done by the city, and number, that's established. Number two. What, what do you mean it's been done by the city? The classification it, it you mean arises if you opt from, in if you opt in no, no 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 there is no other option there's no wage option there isn't there it isn't there. there the city doesn't say it's there the man from the city testified that the city has never even considered having a wage option it isn't there <clears throat> there isn't no way to do that my client testified that there's no way to do that there is no option to, to do that. Do you agree that before the before the 1970s, uh, that that is the way that it ran? I, I I don't I don't know. I don't think there's anything in the record that says that. But even if that were true, we're talking about now. We're talking about a, a regulatory system that does not that first of even if first of all it's a red herring as far as I'm concerned. Look, this system that these people have relied upon is authorized. So even if they had something else that they could have done, hypothetically, which I don't think exists, but let, if the, even if that were true, they have conducted their business as authorized by the city. You know, if there's, and to follow up on that point, the legislature in the workers' comp statute said that this is not employment. Yes, I know, but in, in 148B itself, it says those various things shouldn't count as applying to whether you're defined as an employee or an independent the contractor. The statute says failure to pay the premium. There is no premium, there's no coverage. There's, you can't buy workers' compensation for these people. There is no coverage. That, they're excluded from coverage under the statute by that provision, in, in, and they're also, that's terribly important here. That statute says that if you essentially, if you're paying, uh, if you have a flat fee arrangement, not tied to fares, that is the rent is flat, which is what the city calls this in the regulation, it's tied to the workers' comp provision. This system is that the city has adopted conforms with tracks the, that statute. It says a flat rate, and then this is not treated as uh, subject to employment taxation by the federal or the state government, which is what's happening here. These people are self-employed lessors of taxi cabs. That's what they are under the workers' compensation statute. And this court has said twice, in the Somers case and in the Awua case, twice, during the period that's at issue here, that if this, the arrangement does not deprive, does not violate the workers' compensation statute, which this does not, and does not violate uh, the employment tax laws, it's not an invasion of that, that this statute doesn't apply. These people have, for the whole period that we're talking about here, had <clears throat> five assurances, affirmative assurances that their conduct is lawful. First of all, they're complying with Rule 403. One, if there's anything that the law assures the citizen, it is if you comply with the law, you can't be penalized for doing that. This are, is are, are, there, are there other taxi companies in the state that, uh, that treat uh, taxi drivers as employees? In cities and towns where they don't have Rule 403. But, but do they have workers' comp to cover the drivers? If, 
the minute that you share, um, share the fares with the driver, you have to cover them. They're employees. But that's the way and, it and, used and to let's, run, let's, yes? if, I, if I can just follow up on Justice Pena's question, that there's, a, there's a terribly significant, why is that so? Why is, why is it that if the fee, fares are shared, then you're an employee, and if they're not, then you're self-employed? The answer is that when you lease the cab and you get all the fares, your service is, is compensated for completely and utterly by all the fares, no matter how high they are or how low they are. And the, and the, the lessor gets none of that, zero. He has, to, he has to get all his money in the form of rent, and that's all he gets. Once the risk about the fares, the up and down of the fares is shared, he's deemed to be an employee by the federal taxation authorities and by the workers' comp statute. So that's how the IRS views this, this relationship. Yes. And that's why the, 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 the taxi drivers in Boston don't uh, are, are, not, are, are, are recognized by the IRS as independent contractors. Yes, my sister's position is that they're entitled to wages which are not subject to employment taxation, that, is not, that they're not covered by workers' comp. This is untenable. Not only is it untenable from a, from a logical or any kind of internal logical sense, but it's also in terms of notice to my client. Here are these people who are reporting their income as self, self-employment taxation. They're not covered by workers' comp. The, the court has said on tw two occasions that if that's the case, 148B doesn't apply, and now they're sued for complying with the law. Well, they have done nothing to deserve being sued at all. Counsel, <clears throat> uh, I'll defer to Justice Botsford. Uh, okay, <clears throat> I get your point that uh, the taxi companies have operated under the assumption that what they've been doing is okay with the city and that the city probably would have or should have stepped in if what they were doing was in violation of the law. But going forward, these, these owners are leasing vehicles and those vehicles are not gonna drive themselves. They have to, some, have, to have somebody to drive them and the way they do that is they don't put an ad on Craigslist and say, I have a cab for rent. Uh, does anybody want to rent it? They enter into an agreement with these drivers who are trained for that purpose. So why should that kind of arrangement be allowed to go ahead, to go forward if we understand going forward that that's probably not the way it should be. I don't agree that it's not the way it should be, but in any event, the decision is up to the city, first of all. Second, we're talking here about whether my client gets wiped out by this lawsuit. That, that is, we're not talking about prospective relief here. We're talking about whether or not he can be subjected to a retrospective judgment and as if he owes these people wages after they've already earned and obtained the fares and the tips. That's a non-starter. Uh, it seems to me that what we're talking about here is very simple. My client is, has no assurance that anybody's gonna re rent a cab. He, and there are days when he can have hundreds of cabs sitting there, nobody's rented them. Just as the driver has no assurance about what he's gonna get fares, they are separate businesses under the rule, and the important thing is it is, it is absolutely, un, un, in my view, un, prohibited by the Constitution to say to him, you should comply with this law, you're subject to sanctions if you don't, but we're gonna help hold you liable for millions of dollars because you have. That's, an, that's untenable under the Constitution, you can't do that. It's, the cases are as simple as the cases in the civil rights area where they told people, you can pick it over there. And then when they I, went over there to pick it, they grabbed them. I see you your time is up, that. but I have one last question. I want to make sure I understood. Um, the sanctions you're speaking of, are those simply for violation, or are you saying that you agree that the drivers were not compensated at a rate that, if you calculate it that way, it met the minimum wage in any overtime? 
Yeah, what I'm saying, Your Honor, is that there's no relate, wage relationship at all. Do you know from the discovery whether the workers in this case, who are the plaintiffs, earned enough that they were getting minimum wage and overtime? The answer is that in the record, there's a city study, city commission study, um, that shows that during the period that we're speaking of here, 12 hour shift drivers averaged uh, $59,000 in change a year, net after their expenses. <clears throat> drivers who rented the other part of the 24 hour guys, 62,000 and change. So that's what the record shows. There is no, what I should say, there's nothing about how many hours these guys work. Maybe they made that in eight hours, maybe they made that in 10 hours, we don't know. But we know that they're earning <clears throat> between 59 and $62,000, $63,000 a year. These plaintiffs, okay. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Your Honors. I'm very cognizant of the time constraints you're all under. My name is Albert DiNapoli. I represent two of the defendants, uh, George Summers and USA Taxi. Um, I, I believe that their position is somewhat unique as to that there are questions of fact as to exactly the ordinary course of their business. But I would like to address something I think that uh, uh, Justice Hines just uh, asked Mr. Good and, and also to respond to something Chief Justice Gantz had said. I think Chief Justice Gantz said whether the court should respect the, you're asking the court whether it should respect the regulation that the city of Boston has prescribed respect, here. Respect the categorization given by the regulation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. And I think that as a practical matter, and to dovetail into what something Mr. Good said, is we have to look at these defendants. And were they required to respect the city of Boston regulation? The fact is, these are hardworking individuals themselves that have worked hard in order to save money to purchase medallions, in order to be able to put a taxi for lease up Sometimes they drove them themselves at first, sometimes then they, they leased them. But the fact is, Your Honor, is that <coughs> they worked under a regulatory system. Before they could even get a medallion, they had to file an application, and they had to be allowed by the police commissioner that they were fine to be suitable to own a medallion. Once they obtained a medallion, every year the police commissioner would have to find that they were suitable and sustain their suitability in order that they could con um, contain, continue their ownership of a medallion. The drivers themselves would have to go through applications, the drivers that they leased to would have to go through an application process, a testing process. They had to go through class before they could get a license in order to be able to lease a, um, a, excuse me, a taxi from any of the defendants. The the whole regulatory scheme had a comprehensive, as, I, as the legislature said, this was a comprehensive scheme that they were subject to these regulations. And there were public hearings that the medallion owners went to and where the, the rates that they could charge for the leasing were considered by the police commissioner and the hackney division looking at the public looking at what the taxi drivers would get, how much it cost the medallion owners to be able to operate their cabs, what it cost them. So this comprehensive scheme put these, these owners of these medallions under the regulatory scheme of Rule 403. And plaintiffs say now that they didn't have to comply with Rule 403. Well, Rule 403 was the regulation that they were being subjected to under this scheme that had gone on for over 40 years under a leasing arrangement. But, 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 but why do you say that an employee scheme would be in violation of Rule 403? There was, there was nothing in Rule 403. I mean, if you have to stand back, Your Honor, and look at a, 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 someone who owns a medallion who's been regulated so comprehensively by this structure, and there's a codification by Rule 403 of the police commissioner who's been given the exclusive right to regulate this industry by the legislature, Your Honor, and that they, there's nothing in 403 that talks about a wage are you, relationship. Are you, are you saying in that regard that this, this structured system, it's not that there's anything that says you can't do the other, but the structured system is completely 
um, built on the independent contractor leasing arrangement, and there's an, it's the the rule is completely silent on how it would operate if you had employees who. The preamble of Rule 403 says this is a comprehensive. That, is that what you're saying? Definitive or? listing of all regulations affecting the hackney carriage industry in Boston. Well, but but does does Rule 403 permit a cab company to to uh, come in and seek to be regulated by having employee drivers? It, it's silent as to. But, but, any, so it could any do kind that. Permission. It, it could do that. As as a regulated taxi medallion owner yeah. who's under the regulations of the police commissioner and the police commissioner codifies rule 403 which is silent about any employee relationship the the least lessor lessee relationship had gone on for 30 years before rule 403 it is codified now silent as to employee employee relationship it talks about four leasing arrangements which are allowed you would not expect so so it could a, a cab company could have employee drivers. Well, there's nothing in, in Rule 403 that prohibits that, Your Honor. But if, some, if so you're they a regulated... Could, are, are you telling me that they can't do it? Well, if you're a regulated industry and you have a regulation from the police commission that you've followed through for getting your medallion, hiring, hiring the uh, drivers who at least you knew that they had to go through this regulation, the, the police commission told you what colors you had to paint your cab, Everything down to the minutia was controlled by the police commission, and they codify the leasing arrangement in Rule 403, and there's nothing in it's silent as to an employment relationship. You want to, you, now you're going to say, gotcha. You didn't do an employee relations. You're in violation of, of the uh, independent contract law, and you're going to be subject now to millions and millions of dollars of damages, is what the plaintiffs are trying to say. That's not the way the law should treat Regula people who are trying to follow a regulated industry and the regulations that are in front of hey, them. Can I ask you this, following up on Justice Pina's question? So if, if your client was to say, starting tomorrow, we're going to do a fair splitting model, would that be consistent with 403 or not? It would not be consistent. It would with not be consistent with 403. It would not be it. consistent with right. 403. It would be it's inconsistent. Fair splitting. Inconsistent with 403. 403 says that in the lease arrangement that the fares are for the drivers. We have no way of controlling. It's a flat rent, rent rate set by the city. <clears throat> am I correct or am I wrong about that? It's a flat rate flat for the lease. For the lease set by the city. Set by the city. And we cannot touch the fares as the, the defendants, nor the tips that they get for these fares. And there's no way of controlling that. And to talk about how much do the drivers make there's, there's things in the record by the plaintiffs themselves that they've used these taxis not for purposes even to 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 uh, serve the public, but for their own personal service. So they it, drove to to classes. They they know of the taxi the, drivers that drove to Foxwoods with it, the taxis. So we have no control over them afterwards. But if you if you if you were an entity, a medallion owner, who actually did have employees, could you? You obviously wouldn't lease. It would be a very different arrangement. Does the does Rule 403 prohibit you from doing that, or simply doesn't address that situation right now? I do not believe there's a prohibition in 403, Your Honor. It is, it's silent as to it. And as a regular, and as someone who's under these regulations, I would say, in the practical world, no one would risk stepping outside of the police commissioner's regulations to do something and put themselves at risk at a highly regulated industry like this. And that's what the plaintiff is asking, saying that this court should say that the, these defendants should have done, and therefore, because they didn't do that, they're subject to millions of dollars of damages. So, so, so you know the basis for the city's position? You know the I'm city, sorry, Chair. Do you, can you explain to me the basis for the city's position that the city does not require or endorse any independent contractor relationship. Well, the... the, 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 the that seems completely inconsistent with what you're just... Well, I, I, don't, think, I don't think it is consistent, Your Honor. I think the, the city, uh, some put a disclaimer later on for a, a legal application that they didn't endorse anything, Your Honor. However, the whole regulation 
sets, sets up a lessening relationship, Your Honor. They can, they can put a disclaimer at the end of it, Your Honor, but you wouldn't expect, I hope, uh, uh, someone who is highly regulated to uh, acknowledge that one disclaimer and say, I'm not going to follow the regulation that only authorizes a leasing relationship. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Your Honor.